Hello friends, I am Ankita Dutta, project lead for the Mask Stories at www.tellmeyourstories.biz. Welcome you to the fifth episode of The Mask Factor. I am privileged to have with us author Professor Shoykot Mojumdar this evening and we are going to discuss a word, an era, a story and the significance of them all. Tell Me Your Story calls for submissions of short stories and poems on mask. Also, registrations are open for the writing program season two with the story prompt of women's silence, which is yet another form of mask. Let me begin by introducing Shoykat Sir. Shoykat Mojumdar is the author of three novels, The Scent of God 2019, The Firebird or Playhouse 2015, 2017, and Silverfish 2007. He teaches English and creative writing at Ashoka University and has also published a book of criticism, Rose of the World, 2013, a nonfiction book on higher education, college, 2018, and a co-edited collection of essays, The Critic as Amateur, 2019. His new book, The Middle Finger, a college campus novel about mentorship and intimacy will be published in the fall of 2021. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Ankita. Thank you for having me. It's good to be back with GMIS after a while. I really enjoyed your program, so thank you for having me. Thank you, sir, to you too. Hope you and your loved ones are doing well. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to begin with asking you how your formal or informal conversations in the professional or personal space have changed. I mean, with the new normal. You know, what is your emotional response to the forced digitalization? Yeah, I think we are still very lucky to have this conversation right now, you know, sitting here in a situation where I think literally my first response to what we've gone through this one and a half years is what I call the loss of life. I mean, loss of life most literally. So many people have died, um, but also loss of life in a more abstract sense. You know, for me personally, I lost most of my immediate family members very early on in life. So in a way, when pandemic came there wasn't much more for me to lose but even as I lost people in my acquaintances you know or sort of friends parents what I noticed was that even the loss of life is curiously disembodied you know we don't even get to mourn people get together the morning rituals and by their you know deathbeds they goodbye see the body I mean all of those things which we associate with goodbye to a loved one i mean i know this myself because i lost both my parents when i was overseas i could come uh, and that that is a strange sense it's a very strange and disorienting sense um where you are left with no closure i mean i've lost people and death is just like a message social media message and i'm having a lot of trouble dealing with this that you know not just the scale of the loss of life but the way people are sort of vanished from our lives and, uh, and you know, speaking as a writer, I mean, the tragedy is that for a writer and artist, everything means something, even the most saddest thing means something. And I think most of all, it's a lot of life in a different sense. We have stopped experiencing lives. Um, again, we are among the fortunate ones who can actually do the job of writing, even teaching online. We can work from home, work from home with very much of our lives already. But uh, there's no other life outside us. There's no experience. It's like, you know, the fact of stepping out, the very fact of experiencing the air on your face. My, my daughter was asking me back. I've forgotten, you know, what the air feels like on your face without a mask. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly, we've forgotten that. You know, walking on a street, obviously, socializing has come down. So again, here also is loss of life in another sense. You know, loss of life for the living, even those of us who are living, um, we've we've lost life. And I've, I've written about this experience also because in many ways, I think in you know a certain young generation of writers, people in the sort of late teens, early 20s, in any case, so much of their inspiration comes from the digital space that we've kind of pushed away real life. And the pandemic has forced further into that place where you know physical life is so much of a loss. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I respond to it. It's almost like the world has put on a strange mask, you know, to use the theme for the evening, theme for, theme for today. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, so, sir, these times have given us worries, but also recreation, like detachment, but also family time. So, uh, how does such balance or imbalance, you know, affect your creative faculty? Right. So again, as I said, working from home is something that is not unfamiliar to me. I mean, um, you know, both of us, um, we teach at the university and I spend a lot of time writing. Um, so um, a lot of my work was already from home. I like working from a home space. I I am also not the kind of a writer who spends a lot of time writing in a cafe. I mean, a, a cafe for me is a social space. I love, I love the setting, but I love to write um, kind of you know, unkempt, unshaven, you know, just, I don't have to, nobody can, nobody should see me. So I, I was used to that. Uh, so that part is not, not unusual. Um, obviously, it's good to be able to spend time with the children. I have two small kids, seven and 11. And, um, you know, again, children have, it's a very difficult year for them, you know, sort of missing their friends, everything, no school just being confined but the good side is they're around you a lot and i have come to realize that in many ways you know um having children around is internally a very fulfilling experience externally it leads to some disruptions <laughs> but internally and i realized this since the publication of my you know when i when i had my first child and i wrote the fireboard in many ways the experience of parenthood took me back um you know to uh, a place where I could reach out to my own childhood. It was a very visceral experience. I think it's nothing compared to the experience a mother goes through. Father's experience is very minimal. But even then, there's a powerful kind of an experience. And um, I think given the, the lifestyle we have in, we are obviously thrown together. We are kind of huddled together. And this intimacy has its has its moments, but it also has sort of its sadnesses and obviously everybody all of us miss friends all of us miss you know connections and writing might be um a kind of done in solitude but writers like to get together we like to get together with readers with other writers there's a social aspect to it which um we are very much missing i mean thank god for events like this we can still do it but um it's a very strange life <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so the mask factor is a conversation series which allows us to experiment with and interpret various contexts of a mask. So from that perspective, uh, how would you react if I were to say that uh, art for an artist or more specifically, you know, books for an author is a mask extraordinaire? Like are books the secret of the author or the author is the secret of the book? That's a great question. That's a really fascinating question. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, this is a question which fascinates me, not just as a writer in general, but it's a theme which I've tried to explore in some of my novels as well. You know, probably most notably The Firebird, um, that what is the relationship between art and life? You know, is a, what is what is the difference? Uh, and it is often said that art is a representation of life. Art shows life in a certain way but what does it show really is it the same you know clearly people sometimes think it's a thing people you know um run away to do things what they see in movies they kill people even gun violence you know the, the ill i mean lot people clearly art has a kind of an effect on people's behavior especially popular forms of art but um is it risky is it dangerous and i always i i kind of like to go back to my i was terrible in high school science, but I'm going to use a high school science metaphor to, I mean, for me, what is high school science? Obviously, it's science for everybody uh, to explain. And I, from, from what I remember from my physical science lessons, there was something called um, a physical reaction and something called a chemical reaction. Now, physical reaction and uh, the compounds which came come out of a physical reaction, as far as I remember, and I hope any scientists um, in the audience will correct me if I'm wrong later, is that the uh, the elements are recognizable even after when the compound is formed. So you know what elements go into the making of the compound. The chemical reaction, on the other hand, is where the elements are completely transformed. So you can't see the results. You can't tell what actually went into the making. Um, and I always think of art as the latter. Art is more of a chemical reaction. You know, it's very hard to say 
what aspect of an author's experience, what aspect of a um, you know communal or personal experience, the individual or their gendered or their whatever racial experience, whatever. It's very hard to tell the difference. Um, I mean, it's like um, I mean some of it to use the again a kind of an American immigrant metaphor, the, the salad bowl versus the melting pot. You know. It's, I'd say it's more of a melting pot where things just melt and become a kind of a mishmash. It's hard to tell the difference. And some of it is also like the unconscious because art is so much like the unconscious, you know, so much of, that's why so much of Freud's theories are so useful in interpreting art that um, you can't tell. Look, how, why, why did they have that weird dream? Right? It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, according to Freud, of course, we are always dreaming of you know, sleeping with our mothers and killing our fathers, and most of us would be horrified. But that's exactly the whole point that, you know, we have this civilizing mechanism which separates, which edits our dreams, edits our innermost impulses and presence to society as a kind of a civilized being. And I think much of this comes off in art. You know, in art, these censorships are thrown away, maybe new forms of censorships are introduced. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, it is hard to recognize. And I think there are uh, many debates about this. Different writers, different artists feel differently about it. I mean, obviously, T.S. Eliot said that poetry is, um, you know, not a turning loose of emotions. Poetry is, you know, kind of an escape, you know, and but only, of course, people who have true emotions know how to escape it. It's not an escape from personality. And, um, and but it's hard to say, because then what do you do with something like the memoir? You know, is the memoir, um, you know, is it a mask? You know, is it something? I mean, I would say, you know, in the end, art is really about an exchange of the self. It's an exchange of the self. The right, it's a lot of, a lot of art and literature is about what does it mean to become somebody else? What does it mean? If you're a man, what is it to be like a woman? If you are, if you are, you know, if you're gay, what is it like to be straight? If you are belong to a certain race, what is it? What does it mean to embody otherness? It's about the self, but it's also about otherness. And it's not just the writer, but also the reader. The, uh, you know, true literature comes to meaning when both readers and writers make this attempt, when the reader also is able to reach out of their comfort zone and become somebody else. And you can say, yes, it's a kind of a mask, but it's a kind of a mask where, which is not just meant to hide. It's meant to hide something, but it's also meant to bring something out, right? It's not, not just a hiding mask, it's a transforming mask. I remember this um, wonderful quote by Eugene Ionescu, the playwright, and his play, Rhinoceros. Um, you might know the play is kind of this absurd theater, comedic theater, uh, but also theater of pain and politics. And Ionescu once said that, you know, if you perform the play um, with a mask, you make it a comedy. Uh, if you perform the play, Without a mask, you make it a tragedy. It's a very interesting statement. He was he was saying both forms are valid, but one becomes a comedy and one becomes a tragedy. And I think you know what he meant was that um, when you don't have the mask, when you see real people, when you see real people in pain and suffering, um, it becomes much more tragic. But if you have a mask, you're putting a kind of a sheen of a kind of an artificial reality. You're putting a kind of a symbolism, which is distancing the pain. And by making it comic, making it absurd, taking it to a different level. But mask, you know, in the end is really transformational mask. It is not about, it's not the bank robber's mask who's just trying to hide oneself. It is, it is hiding a self and making another kind of a self apparent. I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you, sir. That was wonderful, actually. Uh, so talking of your novels, you know, Silverfish, Firebird and The Scent of God, the trio tragedy, they inexplicably revolve around the concept of mask, probably intended subtly. Uh, but is such an imposition of implied ideas like an eventual satisfaction of your pen? Right. Um... Well, I think in a fundamental sense, again, in a very fundamental sense, all there is an exchange of masks um, within the work 
and then outside the work again between the reader and the writer. So in that sense, it's I guess all my novels would appeal to that. I guess specific in a specific novel, my first novel, Silverfish, um, you know, one part is about this woman from 19th century Bengal who goes from being a child widow, widow at the age of 12 to and it ends when she's in her late 20s and you know and and, and later on when she's a bit older and she loses a son who is a who, who's uh, who's a terrorist anti-colonial terrorist and she's writing a memoir so which is being read by somebody else you know old man in sort of late 20th century calcutta and obviously the act of memoir in her act of writing a memoir Kamal is putting on a kind of a mask, right? Because first of all, there's this struggle with literacy. She learns to read through cheating. You know, she learns to cheat, read by eavesdropping on her um, brother's lessons. And then her son later helps her to learn to write. So in a way, the moment we write, we put on a kind of a mask. Um, and secondly, any memoir, anybody who's writing a memoir, I think, um, it's very interesting. I mean, if you're writing a diary, I guess you always have a kind of an audience in mind, even if it's very confidential. It is never really confidential. You kind of know that somebody's going to read it. And there is another mask. I mean, that's another interesting question. I mean, if you're writing um, a diary, are you putting on a mask or are you taking all masks off? Um, because writing is automatically always a kind of a performance. You you perform. Um, and that is that is about the act of writing. It's nothing to do with whether you're an honest person or not. It is that. So that sense, I guess, I would say, um, I think in the center of God is probably the most maskless of my novels because these are young boys who are growing up and trying to um, discover their sexuality. They're very shocked at some level that they have sexual urges in an atmosphere which champion celibacy, where se sexuality is a any kind of sex is a crime. And of course, they don't even recognize what it means to be sexually attracted to somebody of the same sex. So in a way, they don't know. The adults, of course, are have masks, the monks, whatever kind of masks they have to put on. I mean, when they put on the sa is saffron a kind of a mask? That's a that's a very important question, I think, in many ways that has become very urgent for today's India. That what does it mean to don saffron? What does it mean to take these vows, Brahmacharya or you know or sannyas? Um, so yeah, the adults have different kinds of masks, but of course I think it's the firebird which is you know the most um, you know most masked of my novels. That's where the mask plays the the biggest role, as you probably know. Thank you, sir. Uh, so moving on to the fifth question, uh, masks have been the eternal symbols of theatre. Your book, The Firebird, is set in the backdrop of Bengal theatre, where Garima is a stage actress. So other than the disguises of her stage, she seems to be split into many images, you know, even in reality. She is someone for her son, someone different for her family members, someone else for her audience. So who is she for the society? Is a different discussion altogether. Is such a connect which falls in line with a woman's journey in a demanding make-believe world your version of all the worlds a stage? <laughs> right, right. Of course you're right and that's exactly why I, I'm, I'm glad that this session took on this novel as its theme because masks are central to theatre central to theater and many other performing arts as choral would know to dance you know so many dance forms so many indian dance forms the mask is very central even when there isn't an actual mask used of course some some dance forms actually use a mask mask and um you know i mean i, I that's why i love that e eugene Ines could quote about whether one performs an absurd theater with with a mask or without a mask whether it makes a comedy um and i think you know um of course a mask in an art form is primarily a kind of a frame that, oh, this is art and this is life. It's a kind of a ritual act. So I'm putting on this, you know, putting on this mask to distinguish myself from life. And I think Firebird, that's the central theme of the Firebird. What is the relationship of art and life? And I ask this question through the art form of theater, like when a child sees, you know, very early on, his mother is dying on stage, he can't tell the difference that, oh, is my mother really dying? He's terrified. And um, and slowly he, uh, those, of, those of you who read the novel, you know that he th this belief is kind of nourished 
you know, in a way, even when he's old enough to know that that is actually not the case, there's a kind of willful suspension of reason that no, 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 if she's doing those things, she's kissing somebody else, she's with another man, she has another family, she shouldn't be doing these things, right? And and Ori also sees that um, society around him has a certain so double standard that men it's okay for them to go and become somebody else on stage when women do that uh, oh there are certain questions about the character oh this woman plays this role you know and you know and and we've seen this you know, in so many ways you know when the Harvey Weinstein scandal broke out I realized that you know in many ways female performers all over the world what the kind of what kind of you know they suspect that they're, 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 they're subjected to and you know this whole um and in some ways, because he's a male child, he starts to internalize this prejudice. And of course, in the novel, the more pathological version of this confusion between art and life is the madman Ohin, who is a theater producer, but he comes from an aristocratic family background. And this family was used to, you know, obviously having actresses at concubines. So in a way, he never really knows the difference in a way for him all actresses are available and he has written a play about a prostitute so you know this leads to all kinds of disastrous circumstances including deaths because his behavior is very dangerous but um the point is you know this is um this this essential m use of mask in performance you know theater you know is it's it's about it's about understanding that there's a transformation of reality going on i mean i was uh, talking about Coral's um, relationship to dance, I know, and I, I think in, she has done this quite well in in her novel Russia, where she talks about dance, and I, I, there's a beautiful scene towards the end where two dancers play two mythical characters, and there's a very interesting way the masks bring out their inner tension. So I think any art form, any performing art form, which requires you to, you know, kind of put on a different role, actually is asking you to put on a mask. Um, I think what is important, though, is that the mask of art, there's no morality. You know, obviously, when you, you know, put on a mask to go in and rob a bank, you know, that, that kind of masking comes with, obviously, has to follow a moral judgment. You're hiding from yourself. Why do you want to hide yourself? Or even in social behavior, if you say, oh, you put on a mask, you don't let yourself be. We're making a moral judgment. Of course, in art, that moral judgment has to go, you know that it is the requirement of art that there is a certain kind of masking going on and i think especially with this novel i mean it because i think what 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 one of the one of the things i was trying to do in this novel is to can one turn performance into prose because performance is a mobile thing it involves bodies it involves sensory experience whereas when you read something you're in a kind of an abstract space you're, you're imagining everything. So my challenge was, can I write a novel of theater? Can I write chapters as theater scenes? Is it possible? And I think, you know, obviously, novels and films have come together in certain ways, novels and music, novels and dance, as I was talking about Coral's work, so many ways. But this is this was my prime challenge. And But in real life, I think it's important, even if there's no morality, that it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. This is exactly why... You know, there's so many books which sort of talk about dangerous behavior on part of the protagonists, and uh, we don't we don't compare them. I mean, of course, my favorite example when it comes to this is Nabokov's Lolita, you know, obviously, which is essentially about a man in his fifties in love with a twelve-year-old girl, and and he's a compelling character. He's a very compelling character, but of course, does it mean it's desirable in real life? I mean, Keith said long time back that. Oh, the saint is boring. The sinner is a lot more interesting as a character. The Yagos are boring. Sorry, the Yagos are much more interesting. The Imogens are boring. He was referring to Shakespeare. So clearly, you know, you have to kind of suspend the moral judgment to a certain degree. I think it's much more complicated when it comes to political judgments. When it's a racial judgment, a gender judgment, then it's a much more complicated thing. Um, but yeah, this one cannot withhold the moral judgment with a mask because literature, any art form is about masking and the performing arts very much, very much so. And that was my big challenge in this novel to make it a performing novel as it were, not just a reading novel, but a novel that performs itself.
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have questions coming in from the audience, but we intend to take all the questions before we conclude the session. So please bear with us and keep posting your questions. Um, so, sir, in a recent interview on the same platform but different project, we were talking about the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Your novel here talks heavily of the orthodox conservative hypocrisy and the compressed societal pressures that build up inside the human psyche. So uh, it involves death and despair and obsession. Uh, is this a parallel interpretation? Like can Ori, a uh, metaphor for firebird, emerge as the phoenix? Yeah, I love that interpretation actually. I love that interpretation. I, I think it's beautiful. And that's the, one of the great things of you know writing books is that people come up with interpretations that have never occurred to you. And then you realize that some of those are actually much better than what you thought of. And this this loss of control as a writer is something I totally enjoy because I think once a work is published or produced or whatever, the writer has no right over it. So there's absolutely so I love all that. But to be honest, I didn't think of that. I didn't think of that while writing. And for me, the the fireboard was, um, as I've said in many spaces, it's really um, a kind of a mistranslation of Jean Anouilh play. Uh, which is La Luit in France and in French, and um, um, the Board of Fire. It was translated as Agunir Pakhi, and it was produced um, as Agunir Pakhi in, in, in Kolkata by the and the, the, the theatre group Bohurupi. And I was thinking of this actually. I was thinking of um, the Board of Fire and that play. As those of you who know, the play it's about Joan of Arc, and there's this unforgettable scene where Joan of Arc uh, is burned. Uh, at the stake, and you know, I remember even watching this Bohurupi production as a child. Um, I, I think I was in high school or something at the time, where there was a fire lit on the stage, and this woman—it's uh, obviously a very powerful feminist play. Also, this woman who's kind of going up in flames, and then later she becomes a saint. Um, and that was my my thing. And of course, you know, again, for those of you who know the novel, fires play a powerful role in the novel because um, you know what happens to Ori is that he his relationship with theater eventually becomes destructive because he can't really process what his mother is doing on stage you know whether she is actually a prostitute or whether she's really a character is questionable as people say um, and there's a lot of violence coming out there's a lot of political violence directed against the theater so um, and this leads to some acts of physical violence stages are set on fire and theaters are notorious for this you know throughout history many playhouses have actually caught fire because they are in any case dangerous for fire the closed en environments and then there are acts of sabotage so there are a lot of so fire played a big role and again fire plays an important role in the novel even in the end i want to give out then if people haven't read it um but i that's what i was mostly thinking in terms of growth I'd say I often think of it as what I call an anti coming of age story. You know, the Bildung Stroman of the coming of age story is, um, you know, a character growing up, not just growing up in age, but becoming responsible, becoming educated, taking up their place in society. And the great European Bildung Stroman always ended with, you know, the, and it was always a male genre, a very white genre, um, ended with them getting a job, you know, finishing education, becoming a father. So all the normative things you're supposed to do as part of a society. And I think of it, I have a pension for what I call the anti coming of age story. So in a way, Ori fails to become a responsible citizen. He falls in bad company. You know, first of all, there's this kind of incest running through his life, you know, his attitude towards his mother, his cousin. And then he basically falls with the bad crowd, a kind of a violent crowd, a crowd which unleashes a campaign of violence against theater, politically motiva motivated. And it ends when he's 14, but he's quite far from becoming a normative good citizen. And that is definitely how I think of it. So I, I don't know if there's a, I don't think there's anything as optimistic as a rebirth in the end. There is definitely fire, but um, I don't know what, you know, what if there's a phoenix, but definitely there's fire. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, the book weaves various threads, you know, the juncture of the year 1984 of the phrase, the party, of the belief remain orthodox 
and of the parade of nonchalant deaths and simultaneous justifications. So can I resemble the outcome as Orwellian? Like was Ori's Calcutta society a dystopia? You know, I think um, I think in India, and almost like in every dystopia has become so real that I think that we cannot use the word dystopia anymore. Everything is so real. <laughs> in 2021 we see it and of course we are living through a pandemic so i think the word dystopia can't describe to us anyway um i think you know this was obviously set in the 80s the you know the, um, 80s in calcutta those of us um, grew up in that time i think we also remember them as a time of great despondency a kind of a dark time uh, and obviously calcutta you know the great age of calcutta and modernity it's sort of the first commercial city and all of that had started to decline, especially with the communist government coming into power in the late 70s. And it was this time of, you know, traffic jams, load shedding, terrible things. And, you know, before the liberalization happened and a few things changed and terrible communist corruption, terrible corruption, the moral policing of women. And, um, you know, and I, I left Calcutta in the 90s you know, um, after finishing college. But of course, you know, my memory of the 80s, um, I think in many ways that was a despondent time, a dark time, but there was something magnetically attractive, artistically attractive about the darkness, something really attractive about the despondency. Um, it's almost like the decline of something wonderful, something big. It's like a slowly decaying, massive banyan trees and it's mournful it's very sad it's very tragic but there's a tragic beauty to that you know there's a tragic beauty to that and you know and that is um and i think in, in some ways it turned out to be artistically very fertile there was this whole for instance this whole conflict between different traditions of theater you know a certain kind of communist belief behind a certain kind of art forms um i think these are um very fascinating. I've, I've continued to be fascinated by these things slowly. For instance, later on, what happens to the coming of saffron in Bengal, the slow rise, all of those things. But I think with this, um, and uh, I, I, I think it's hard for me to think of it as a dystopia because it was also real. But I'd say these were very dark times, very despondent times. These were also the times when people were unemployed, no jobs. It was not the kind of 21st century digitized India. There was a kind of hopelessness about it. And I think first, both my first novel, Silverfish, and my second novel, The Firebird, is set in these times. And um, But I think this darkness was very real. I wouldn't call it dystopian. It was very real. I've always been drawn to the real. You know, I have not, not, I, while I love the fantasy in, in, in my reading and films, I think as an artist, I always return to the real because the real world for me is always more fantastical than anything, you know, fictional fantasy can, can offer. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, actually. Uh, so as for our formal session, I would like to conclude my questionnaire with the last, but not the least. If someday while taking a stroll, uh, maybe behind the Academy of Fine Arts or around the temporary stage somewhere near Rampur Hat, you happen to meet Ori in reality with eyes full of dreams to occupy the spotlight, which book of yours would you hand over to him to play the hero? <laughs> well, that's a really tough question. I'm really glad you pick up Rampur Hat as a suburb because that obviously a suburb plays a role in the novel. That's just the way the city plays a role. It's a hard question because, um, you know, um, there's some of some of me in Ori. I mean, you know, I I mean, the story is fictional and yet my own mother was also a theater actress. And I know, I mean, that primal terror of the first scene of watching a mother die on stage. I know that from my own life, um, you know, uh, and uh, and Ori cannot act, you know, because Ori is paralyzed. He's he's paralyzed with fear he wanted to act and then you know he realizes that he just can't because his, his mother it's a, it's a dark place his mother pushes him away from it um and um but i think you know if i have to hand him a book i will have to hand him the firebird and just tell him that let all masks come off you know take off the masks you know you must become <laughs> become that what um you are and in a way that would be undoing of his own confusion that art and life 
are not the same. I mean, can you play yourself? Can you become yourself? You know, um, I, I think, you know, in some ways, the next chapter of his life might be the center of God where he finds love, where he finds a very unusual kind of a mask. And, and I think the book ends with the question to return to your theme, is saffron a mask? Is saffron a mask in today's India? Right. I end with the question. I think you're muted. You're muted, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, that was wonderful, actually, to hear. We will take the audience questions now. So uh, we have Puma Chakraborty, who asks, uh, maybe art allows the artist unbridled freedom to be true to himself or herself in the public eye. No, that's it. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, but it's a, again, it's a very difficult question to answer because I think art is about becoming the self and also unbecoming the self at the same time. Because um, I think an artist's responsibility is always begins with the self. You know, if you, you can't really create art unless you. So this is explains why artists are actually centered around the self. They are kind of egoist in some sense, you know, in a kind of loftier sense. And hopefully they're not total assholes in public. <laughs> Sometimes they might be, but they are, you know, they're egoistic. Yes. But it only begins there. Our artist is never complete unless they have empathy for others. In an artist, an interest is oneself is actually inseparable from an interest in the world. They have to come together. So this, you know, this is at the very first, very technical level in writing a novel. You okay? Some characters might be based on your experiences, but everything cannot be. You know, how do you know to create somebody who's very different from you? Somebody very different from you in class. That putting on the shoes of somebody else. That becoming somebody else. And uh, is it being true to oneself? Possibly because um it makes you it forces you to tap into parts of yourself you cannot deal with sometimes i mean i know you know i know the blend of fiction and reality in the firebird and i know even though it's fiction in a strange way i don't think i could have written that novel while my own mother was living because obviously as people who've read the novel knows it does end with a kind of a tragedy and it's sometimes certain things are too hard to bear in reality. And even after the novel was published for a long time, it was very hard for me to talk about oh, what exactly is the relationship of the novel with my own life. You know? And so um, I think free, I mean, when you say true to himself or herself, being true to oneself is not just a matter of freedom. It, it can be a very painful thing. Sometimes it's often easier not to be true to oneself. It's so much easier. It's so much easier to actually move around with a kind of a mask. So in that sense, yes, I'd say art is a kind of a primal unmasking, a kind of an unmasking which is even hard for us to handle. It's a bit like a dream, like, oh, why did I have that terrible dream? You can't explain in real life, but there are things inside you. There are, you know, bats and insects and deaths and weird stuff flying inside you don't know. It just comes out. Thank you for that question. Uh, thank you, sir. We have Shubhosri Karanjay who uh, asks, Ori keeps behind something always. What is your take on that? Shoykata, does that not give you a sense that Ori is also masking something from his creator, you? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree, Shubhosri. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, I think it's a I think it's a it's really great for any novelist, any novel to see that one's novel is changing meaning for readers succeedingly. And I know the earlier expert, I mean, I know your reading of this novel earlier and the fact that it continues to sort of shed new skin like a snake and put on new skin every year. I mean, there must be something I, I hope there is something in him to keep inviting these different kinds of interpretation. You know, I, I had, um, you know, a um, few, few days, a couple of months back, uh, um, Shujay Prashad, uh, an actor, he used this novel as a, 
as a kind of documentary for Kolkata theater. And then the character of Ori, which is the central, you know, I think um, I'm scared of him. I mean, he scares me. I mean, even no matter how much of him me he has, it's frightening. And that's when you realize the characters you create may have something of you, but they have so much alien stuff, so much frightening stuff that they scare the crap out of you. So um, I think so. I think you're absolutely right. We can never know. I mean, you know, when you create a character on page and you just realize after a page, it's a living being. It's not behaving the way you want it to behave. You, it's changing. Even the dialogues are coming out different. It's a it's a ghostly experience. It's really like a horror film. And yet, you know that your fiction is actually working when it's out of control. I think this is the great thing about literature is that you know it's successful when it's not in your control. With most other disciplines, I think we want to bring it under our control. Literature is at its best when it runs away from its creator. Thank you, sir. Uh, we next have Nazneen Kashwala, who asks you, can metaphors at times act as a mask? Also, you talked about the memoirs being a mask. Does it come from the idea that the writers write with a single perspective? Okay, again, a very difficult question, a very important question. Thank you, Nazneen, but a very difficult question. Um, you know, I always think it's a question of who makes a metaphor. Like, if the metaphor is something crafted by a writer later, then it's language that's keeping it together. But um, there are something called natural metaphors. Like, I mean, it's almost like it occurs in reality. Like, I'm thinking, obviously, right now, so much of our associations are about death. Um, what does it mean? I mean, what does a crematorium stand for? I mean, is it a metaphor? Is it a, I mean, things which are associated together. I think I am, as a writer, I am less interested in the crafting of metaphors because that becomes a writerly choice. So I can make this stand for something, but something which just evokes. I mean, I, I remember one of my early short stories when I wrote was um, just about this, whatever a person leaves behind, I think there was an ashtray with a half burnt cigarette, um, a pair of glasses put down, a newspaper. It was like I was just just high school student. I was trying putting things together, but a half burnt cigarette, a, a pair of glasses left, and I was writing a story like, oh, is that a person's signature? These are the things that belongs to a person. I mean, when you take things out of your pocket, when you take things out of your bag, and you put it somewhere, you know. And then someone looks at those things and says, oh, these things aren't that person. You know, that is what they are to me. This is not an external metaphor. This is what life constructs. I'm really interested in these things that what makes something natural. I mean, what are you, Nazneen? What are the three objects that you can put down somewhere and people can say, oh, that is Nazneen for me? You know, what are the words you might say? What are the things that people associate with you? And this is what I'm, I'm always telling in my creative writing classes, that it's not about describing a character in detail. Give one or two idiosyncratic details. You know, it's not about describing somebody's dress, but some coffee stain somewhere or some weird way of moving one's hand. That is the signature. So that kind of natural metaphor, I think, is what is really important. Thank you for that question. Thank you, sir, for answering that so beautifully. Uh, Next, we have Shudeep Ghosh. He asks, mask as a motif plays an important role in the scent of God. So how different is the lifting the veil compared to the firebird? Right. You know, I, I, great question again, because I think of these two books as in many ways twin books. As I said, I think um, mask is obviously directly important in the firebird, which is, I think, why Coral shaped this session around the mask. Um, because theater is obviously a kind of a performance. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think the scent of God, if you bring up the question of the mask, it's a, it's a very it becomes a very dangerous question because then we have to ask those questions about religion, you know, and what kind of masks do religion involves? Uh, what kind of masks does a monastic brotherhood involve? What does it mean when you give up 
these clothes and put on saffron? Uh, are you putting on a mask? Or are you giving up a mask? I think these are very disturbing questions which um, will probably upset a lot of people. You know, um, you know, I obviously, in a way, hint at those questions when it comes to sexual behavior. I mean, what does it really mean to be celibate? Can a person really be celibate all their lives? And of course, as you know, in the center of God, celibacy is simply interpreted in terms of no women. In other words, you know, there can be no sexual activity between men having men. So I think those are the questions we have to talk about. You know, is religion a generally religion a mask? What kind of mask do we put in when we enter a temple or, you know, whatever, you know, do our do our prayers in any religion, whether at home or in a church or a mosque or a temple? Uh, and secondly, on a more serious level, what does it mean to take up a religious life? What does it mean to enter an order? What does it mean to give up civil life? Is that a kind of a mask? Um, I think these are very dangerous questions, but also on very important questions given the kind of place religion has come to take in today's national life. You know, because religion has taken up so, so many political questions. In many ways, the mask of religion is all over national politics right now. So thank you for the very important question. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have Shabarno Sinha. Uh, I'd like to know from Shoikadda whether he thinks that his native tongue has influenced his form of storytelling or the kind of novel he has written as a whole. Okay. Again, a question I, I really appreciate because I think it's very much in my mind and I've also written something on it. Uh, definitely. I think, um, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned this before that you know, even though I grew up reading a lot of Bangla, watching Bangla, my formal training was always Western aesthetics and Western art. And I was trained, I lived in the US for many years. And so obviously when I started writing, it was very much a, oh, a very new critical. This is how a Joyce and Lawrence and all that kind of mode. And then when I read not just Bangla literature, but obviously writers like Mumanto or Anantamurti in translation, I realized that um, there's something narrow about my definition of art. There's something very specialized that a lot of this writing seemed like bad writing. And that forced me to really revise what I consider good writing, oh, especially since I sp spent so much time reading Joyce, who was a very perf kind of a perfectionist on the level of the sentence, the kind of fluffy sentences from Vernaculus, really. And I think this lesson really happened at the time of writing The Fireboard. I think Fireboard is still a kind of a Western crafted novel in that sense, but its values, like what is the idea of a gossipy para? a gossipy neighborhood? What is the meaning of prejudice in a conservative sort of neighborhood about the behavior of women? I mean, I I was like, these are very local values. So what I wanted to do, and also Bengali theater was such a big role, you know, also international theater and you know, Greek theater or Shakespearean theater, but very much Bangla theater. You know, how do these roles come to play? So in many ways, I think, and I've come to discover this in many other writers and many other English writers have also done this, going back to Raja Rao, to many contemporary writers, I think have done this. I mean, I, 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 in my early years, I sort of started reading Amit Chaudhary and Amitav Ghosh's early novels, and they obviously bring the Bengali sensibility in a beautiful way alive, you know, in, um, in, in English writing. So yes, for me, uh, what I call the vernacular life of English, is extremely important that I, I think um, without what I read in Bangla, without uh, not just the language, but also a kind of an alien value. I mean, I was just reading Shonil um, you know, um, um, Prothumalo, and it reminded me Shonil Gangopadhyay's one unique way of writing is he writes with a lot of commas. So in English, in grammatically, we call it comma slices. Whatever can be joined with a full stop, he uses a comma. And that style, creates a kind of odd, intimate, you know, kind of colloquialism. And I love that style. That's a kind of grammatically wrong style. But, you know, there are so many things which I have admired. And they don't, I don't necessarily use them myself. But again, it becomes a kind of an unconscious process. So I definitely try to infuse. And I think it happens naturally because I spend a lot of my artistic life in Bangla. 
and they enter and shape my novels in a significant way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next one, probably the last question we have, is from Kasturi Patra. I could relate to this brilliant novel on a personal level because many of my stories are set during the same time period in Kolkata, but most of my protagonists are young girls. Do you think Ori's sensibilities would be differently shaped by the events in The Firebird had he been a girl instead of a boy? That's a great question. And, um, and I know uh, Kosturi has written a really wonderful novel which is due to come out where a girl is missing a mother and her mother goes missing. I, I just loved reading her novel in manuscript. So I, I, I appreciate that the question is coming from you. Um, I, think, I think it's really powerful because I think in many ways, the initial driving force in this novel is what obviously Freud is called the Oedipus complex. That, oh, that's my mother. And my mother um, is with someone else, you know, or she can't be somebody else's mother or somebody else's husband. You know, she can't have a life on stage that is not mine, you know, that is disturbing to me. I, I don't want that and I want to possess her, you know. And initially, this was a kind of a I mean, there was a scene in the fireboard where he steps out in the streets and sees his mother's name in the graffiti on the walls. And he touches the name. There's a sense of pride that, oh, this is my mother's name in a public space. And then quickly a sense of shame. He kind of looks back and sees, oh, if anybody's watching me. So because obviously the role of the actress is a curious combination of pride, fame, and shame. And even as a young boy, he knows the touch of everything, that what it's to be proud of someone and ashamed of the same person at the same time. But of course, it is very much conditioned by his gender because he's a boy. I think boys, especially if you're the only son, uh, they are driven by a sense of possessiveness of their mothers. And this possessiveness is fractured by his mother's life on stage, which you can't make sense of. And then what I think disturbs me most about this novel is that it is really Ori's, a young boy's growth into a patriarchal society. He slowly grows into imbibing the prejudices a male-dominated society gives you. You may be proud of your mother, but you feel that, oh, as a mother, as a woman, she shouldn't be doing these things. Her job is at home. She At evening, she dresses up, looks beautiful, smells fragrant, and goes out. What kind of woman does that? There's only one kind of woman who does that. And she belongs to an unnameable profession. And I think, you know, at some level, this sort of touched the a child of any gender. But of course, it touches the male child in a particularly toxic way. Um, and I mean, I um, I don't want to, I shouldn't be talking about Kasturi's novel because I know it's not yet published. But even in your novel, there's a male and brothers and sisters, and obviously you remember they react differently. But I think you know it's it's actually definitely something about the Oedipal, Oedipus complex and the sense of a right. And when does a son's sense of possessiveness over a mother becomes a man's right over a woman? I think there's a slow transformation of the process that happens here. So yes, I think it's quite important that this is a male child, and I think it would be different. I mean, for instance, even in the Firebird, the Shruti, who's not Burima's daughter, but she's a cousin, her relationship with her, uh, her aunt's acting is completely different. She adores her aunt. She loves her. She loves her and she admires her, much to the anger of Shruti's own mother, who hates her sort of... Um, sister-in-law because she's she does all these bad things in theater whereas she has a regular job but clearly between Ori and Shruti you have a difference so yes I think it's a very important question and I think the gender of um, Gorima's child is very important thank you thank you so much sir and I thank the audience for such wonderful questions uh, so at Mask Factor we are discussing whole new perspectives thanks a lot Shrikat sir Thank you for this very insightful conversation and also for your time this evening. To everyone, thank you. Thank you. To I everyone, love great question. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. And to everyone, let me put a reminder tell me your story calls for submissions on masks and registrations are open for the writing program season two. 
with the story prompt of women's silence, which is yet another form of mask. We hope to hear from you. And till then, let us all try to stay well, stay safe, and though distanced, let us stay together. Good night. Bye-bye.